Good evening and welcome to the latest in our series of short stories, tall tales. The title of this uh, Good evening and welcome to the latest in our series of short stories, tall tales. This edition is called Waterloo, John Rennie, Black Drop Opium and the Docklands Dislocated Doorway, which is a bit of a change for us in this series. Most of you probably know this man here, James Gandon, built the Custom House, which opened for business in 1791. Less well known is that the area around Memorial Road was actually built as a, as a dock or harbour. It became known as the Old Dock later on. Very quickly, it became a really, really busy place, as you can see from the painting over on the right hand side. Um, but there were a lot of issues with this dock because within 10 years of being built, it really wasn't fit for purpose. If we look at pictures of the dock of the Custom House, and this is the first one, which was by James Malton, and painted slightly before the building was finished. <clears throat> what we tend to see is a really beautiful building with just a little bit of animation going on around it. But this was the reality, and this is from around the time of the Battle of Waterloo, um, which was fought in 1815. And basically what you have is, yes, there is a very, very impressive building, but there is a huge amount of business going on around it. You can see all the chimneys with smoke pumping out of them. They were various factories around the area. And this was the impression that they really wanted to give of Dublin. It was a place to come and do business and where business could be done. And it was a very vibrant place. And it was particularly enhanced by this. The painting is by an artist called Thomas Santel Roberts. But the engraving plate eventually found its way to a man called Thomas Kelly, who was a printer in London. And he was one of the first of what we would probably call a picture agent. And he distributes this to encyclopedias, guidebooks, and all sorts of things all over the world. And this is the image that people saw of Dublin as a place that you could really come to and do business at that period. And this is what it was like up close. <clears throat> In the Malton picture, we've got a few people wandering around the steps. The reality was every day you had people coming down to work in the port, you had people working on ships, you had crews and porters and dockers taking things on and off, you had passengers coming down to get ships to foreign places, you also had lots of people just coming around to hang out, and you also had a lot of theft going on as you might expect in a place like this. Another one of the big problems that was going to develop was with that amount of people messing around. And because it was open on four sides, it was very easy to sneak things in and out of the port without actually having paid any duties or tax on them. And this was going to become a growing issue as the port became very busy in the aftermath of 1815. Now, one of the other issues for the people for the authorities in the port was the fact that, yeah, they created this really nice crescent shape around the custom house by demolishing a lot of the buildings in the area. But the actual roads that led down to that crescent weren't particularly impressive. A lot of them were very run down. And so they thought, wouldn't it be nice to actually get a gate? That was fit for purpose and created the right type of impression as you came into the custom house from the city. But another issue that, that was going on at the time was suddenly there were a lot of people moving into the port area and the north inner city and you suddenly had lots of children running around the place playing hurling and there were hurling balls flying at great speed and a lot of people were getting injured and so they needed to find a way to keep all of them out and keep peace and tranquility and a level of control. And so this man is brought in to try and organize things and his name is John Rennie and John Rennie is the father of modern structural engineering. He was from Scotland and he was one of the really great engineers. Now, his main job in Dublin is to create a series of new harbours, George's Dock, the Inner Dock, or the Revenue Dock as it was called, but he's also going to be responsible for laying out the plans for what was known as Stack A or CHQ building as we know it today, the sugar stores or Stacks B and C, um, but he also finds that uh, Gandon's Harbour isn't fit for purpose, so he's effectively going to have to rebuild that. But on top of that, he's also working with harbours in Dunleary. He's working with harbours 
uh, up in Belfast. He's working with harbours in Hoth. He's working with harbours down in Cork. He's working with harbours in Waterford. And he's working in harbours with Donna Cadee. And that's just in Ireland. He also has jobs in England. He also has jobs in Scotland. Um, so he's a very, very busy man. But in the middle of all of this work and all of this planning that he's involved with, they ask him in 1813 to build a doorway that'll be fit for purpose and make the entrance into the Docklands uh, impressive. And so he builds this archway type structure on the left. Now, basically, it's a pretty classy piece of masonry, but by no means is it a triumphal arch. But there's been a tendency to suggest that it was a triumphal arch that Rennie was built in anticipation of a victory at what became the Battle of Waterloo. If you look at the picture on the right hand side, that was the original gate of the custom house that preceded the one that's now in Custom House Key. It, that was up near uh, Parliament Street. And they're practically the same thing. And in, it's quite possible that a lot of the gate up near Parliament Street was probably recycled and brought down um, to use in this structure here because he really wouldn't have had the time to spend on it. Um, but it, by any stretch of the imagine, it definitely wasn't a triumphant arch. But the Battle of Waterloo comes in 1815. The victory is led by Arthur Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington. But Ireland was already participate, um, well geared up for his victory because the man on the right is his brother, Richard Colley Wellesley, and he at one stage was Viceroy of India. And in those days, cousins were cousins and everyone had dozens of them. So half of Ireland seems to have been prepared with their uh, involvements uh, at various levels in the East India Company. So once the ports start to open up after the Battle of Waterloo, Ireland starts to flood with exotica. And all sorts of weird and wonderful things start to come into the port. And in a lot of cases, they're repackaged into other things and they're exported out of the port. And one of the most intriguing of all of these products is this. Ireland became a net exporter of opium to mainland Britain between, 19, between 1815 and 1830. May have gone on longer, but we don't have the figures for it. Now, you might ask yourself, what is... <laughs> What kind of opium products were we actually exporting over to Britain? Well, there was a, there was a confectioner up in Capel Street made opium sweets, but the most probable product that we were exporting was laudanum was one of the most common forms of opium. And again, it was highly addictive, but there was suddenly there was a resurgence in a thing that was called black drop. Lancaster black chop was the most popular sort. It was made by butlers who were in O'Connell Street. Um, and basically, you made black drop by taking half a pound of opium, you boiled it with uh, fermented vinegar, mixed in some nutmeg and some saffron, and then you'd let it you'd let it cool off and sit for about six weeks with some yeast. And then, when the whole thing had thickened up nicely, you added some sugar to taste, put it into bottles, and it sold for between four and twenty-two shillings each. So it wasn't cheap. It was also highly addictive. But it was just one of the exotic things that started to flow through Dublin port. And with all of this going on, um, Rennie dies. And there's a huge amount of work needs to be done. And so the man on the left is brought in as his replacement. And he's probably an even more significant figure than Rennie in terms of the history of structural engineering and his name is Thomas Telford but what's particularly interesting is is when he's working on the construction of the CHQ building he brings in the man on the right and his name is William Hazeldean from Shrewsbury. Hazeldean is uh, an iron founder. He's the man who really pioneers large-scale uh, cast iron works and one of his specialities is fireproof buildings using cast iron uh, building structures and he builds the roof of the CHQ. Now it wasn't something, there were a lot of problems, they were out of his control, it wasn't a project he would have been particularly happy with, it wasn't a project that he particularly wanted at the top of his CV, but it is hugely significant that three of the absolute giants of the beginnings of structural engineering as we know it um, all worked on a building in Dublin down on the Docklands. 
Now, as they build these buildings, and with all the problems of theft and people not paying duty and everything else, it's decided they really need to enclose the port. And the first thing they do is they put a fence around the custom house and then they decide to build a wall that will go right around the port area. By the time this picture uh, is made, which is just after the famine in 1846, you have the Great Northern Railway arrives and effectively that cuts the port area off from the rest of the city. It almost becomes a walled town within the city. And in order to get in and out, you're going to need a series of gates. So you have this swing bridge here that'll connect over the old harbour that had been designed by Gandon, and that'll bring you down into George's Dock and the Revenue Dock and all the other activity that's happening down along the port here, along North Wall Quay. There's a second gate um, up here at Common Street. Um, and that, that's basically where a lot of the workforce are going to come through um, who will live in houses that are built in and around the other side of the wall there. And then Gandon's Gate, or uh, Rennie's Gate, which is no longer necessary up in Eden Quay, is taken down and it's moved over here behind these buildings to make what becomes known as the Store Street Gate. And it remains there into the 1990s. Now, again, because a lot of companies start to build hotels and because you have a lot of companies set up warehouses and retail shops of high-end products, and you have all of these kind of exotic things are coming through the port, it starts to get reflected in the type of economic activity that's happening along the key front. So, for example, up here on the top right, you have the old Eagle Tavern, which is one of the very early gin palaces. Um, very, very extraordinary pub. That was actually demolished in the 1960s. Below that, you have uh, James McDonald's in 1913. Um, a man called John Stanley takes over the pub. He's going to set it up as Dublin's very first cocktail bar. They'll do a range of over 60 cocktails. He'd bring in a range dur during the, <clears throat> the Hote and Lauren gun running. They develop a range of gun running cocktails, they call them, using an absinthe base. And throughout the First World War period, um, it becomes the place to be in Dublin. It's now come back as the Bottle Boy and the staff in the Bottle Boy have tried to recreate some of the classic cocktails from the uh, World War I era, era. Next to that, over on the left at the bottom, is the Liverpool Bar. That was originally the London and Liverpool Hotel. And during one part of its existence in the 19th century, that operated as a champagne bar. That was quite important because that was directly across from the passenger service of the city in Dublin, Steam Packet Company, and that's where their ships came in. So it was always a very, very busy bar with uh, an hotel with uh, the number of passengers that would be coming through the port. And then at the top, we have the London and Northwestern uh, Hotel, which is based down on North Wall Quay. Um, again, this was known for, for fine dining in its day, one of his house specialities was wood pigeon, and there's a touch of serendipity there because uh, even when I was growing up as a child, it often felt like the 1916 Rising was being reenacted because behind the London Northwestern Hotel, you had the uh, merchant warehouses, and they had huge big brain warehouses, and at least once a month you would have gun clubs coming down uh, to cull the local pigeon population and keep them away from the brain. And then all the pigeons would be picked up and they'd be brought round to the nuns who ran various penny dinner establishments around the north inner city. So there was a kind of a quality there between what the poor and the rich were eating. We're going to take a little jump now to 1911. And this is the harbour master and all his staff. Most of these guys at the top are the harbour police. But these three men here are the gate men of Dublin Port in 1911. And it's their story we're going to look at next. Now, the first of these, um, you can see them here now on their own. Now, the first of these is this man. His name is John Nolan. Now, John Nolan was originally from Carlow, 
But it's curious because the first gate man on Dublin Port was a man called Robert Nolan. Now, we don't know if they were related, but the Nolans were a family that had a long, long presence uh, in the Dublin docks. <clears throat> they would have been one of the oldest families uh, up, to most, up to very recent times. John Nolan was also, as well as being the gate man on the Common Street gate, and this is Common Street just behind here where you can see the shop. Um, most of it has been demolished now. Um, John Nolan was also an organiser with the Transport Union. And famously, during the 1913 lockout, he actually stopped uh, a ship have unloading a number of trucks that were going to be used to try and break the Carter strike on the docks. Um, and that gives you some idea of his politics. His son, who worked in the shipyard down the docks, is the man on the right-hand side. His name was Sean. He was in the Irish Citizen Army, and Sean fought with the ICA up at City Hall during 1916. So because of that, Common Street literally becomes open access during the Rising. Um, you have snipers come and go as they please. The important part of it is, is that although there wasn't a huge amount of people actually fighting, this is where the, Britain are, the British are actually thinking of bringing their troops in. And because of the fighting that happens, because they're constantly under fire, because there's constantly people taking pot shots at them, they eventually decide that they'll bring troops in on Dunleary. And it extends the time that it's going to take them to get organised to attack the GPO. So what happens in the Docklands is actually it does have a really huge bearing on what actually happened uh, in the overall rising during Easter week. This is the man who was in the middle of the photograph, and his name is Michael Connolly. Now, Michael Connolly was from Straffan in Kildare. As you can see here, this is the register from the uh, Transport and General Workers Union for 1915 um, for the Port and Docks, and three of his sons had been brought into the union by Michael. They wouldn't all stay there, but Michael was with the Port and Docks for over 30 years. He was also a transport uh, workers uh, a transport union organiser, um, and he was also heavily involved in local politics, as well as being a member of the Irish Citizen Army. Now, during the Rising, he has six children involved. Five of them are going to be at the City Hall. Sean, his eldest son, is the commander at City Hall, and he's one of the first volunteers to be killed uh, during the Rising. The man at the top is his second eldest son, Joe, and he's got a fight at, at Stephen's Green. He had a daughter called Kitty. She was also involved in the fighting at the City Hall area. Now, because he had basically all of his children um, fighting during Easter week, James Connolly had said to him he wasn't to take up arms, he wasn't to go out and fight, and his wife was almost a was very definite that she wasn't going to lose all of her family to the Irish Citizen Army. But Michael had been, as a young child of, of, at the age of 10, he had led <clears throat> the Wicklow Fenians over the Wicklow Mountains to the Battle of Talla. His family had also been evicted uh, for agitation during the Land League period, so he wasn't the type of man who was going to sit down and let a fight pass him by. <clears throat> and this is where he lived. It was in Sean McDermott Street. It's the house with the yellow door. <clears throat> and what he decides is he's going to get the, the family arm stash out and he starts oiling down the rifles. Now, they had a lot of arms stored in this house. It's in uh, the coal shed, under the floorboards, uh, behind cupboards, um, everywhere. And he, as I said, he's oiling down the rifles and his wife realises what's going on and so she locks the door so he can't get out. But it is believed that he handed the rifles out through the windows to people who were looking to get involved in the fighting. And again, a second front opens up in this area, particularly around Oliver House, which is the main supply depot for the post, post and telegraphs. And a lot of the telegraph equipment that they're trying to set up down near Amian Street Station is going to have to come from Oliver House. And again, with all the fight, the shooting going on at Oliver House and the shooting going on at Amian Street, it 
forces the British to be cautious. And like the activities of John Nolan, his activity up around Sean McDermott Street puts the element of doubt and helps extend the rising. So the activity of both of them is actually really, really significant. But after the rising, the house is raided and they find an old ceremonial sword. And so Michael Connolly gets arrested because they assume he must have had some involvement in the rising, which is probably true. Now, it's very quickly sorted out that he hadn't, uh, he hadn't been guilty of anything, but he had, was deported to Stafford prison in England. And because he was deported, he gets fired by the Port and Docks Board. And they fire him very publicly because they announce it in the newspapers uh, as part of their, their monthly, uh, the reports of their monthly meeting. But Michael Connolly isn't going to take this sitting down and he decides to sue them. And his strategy is based on the idea that, well, if he's been, been fired for going to war, both the Dublin Port and Docks and Dublin Corporation and a number of other companies and Guinnesses and people like that had all offered an arrangement to their workers that if they went to war, they would be re-employed when they came back. And so if he's been fired for going to war, the agreement didn't say which side he had to be fighting for. And so he's entitled to his job back. And this is about to become very messy and very embarrassing. And so you can see this is the first entry involving Michael Connolly in the Port and Docks Minutes, this writing down at the bottom of the picture. He's going to turn up almost every month for the next year he will turn up in the minutes of the Port and Docks meetings. Um, as his case goes further and further down the road, and it becomes more and more apparent that they're probably going to lose the case if it goes into court. In the meanwhile, he needs a job, and so he applies for the role as a, a, release, a, a, a relief supervisor with the South Dublin Union, and the job involves him distributing coal. He has to go up for election. He wins the election. And he's like a man possessed because it's a particularly difficult job because there are companies who, have, who are contracted to supply the coal, but he has to organise the deliveries, which means he has to get guys like this with horse and carts because that's what they would have been using. They wouldn't have been able to take huge loads. He then has to ensure that it gets delivered to the right, the right addresses. And he has to work in quite a number of areas of the city. And he was, the report suggests he was doing between eight and 900 bags of coal every week, which is astonishing considering that he was nearly 60 years of age. And um, when you compare it to the figures for other people who were involved in similar work with the South Dublin Union, his productivity is nearly twice that of the ordinary, uh, of the other workers who are doing the, doing the same type of relief work. And at one stage, he actually writes and asks for a pay rise because he says he's uh, he's literally working from sun up till about eight o'clock in the evening. But eventually, in August, uh, the Port and Docks has to accept the fact that they're going to lose the case, and so a compromise is reached that they will pension them off. They have to give him an extra nine years service, and so he ends up with a pension of thirteen shillings and sixpence. And because of its success, his son Joe decides to do exactly the same thing with Dublin Corporation. He had been a, a fireman and he sues on the basis that he went to war and now he's back from war and he wants his job back when he gets back from the detention over in England. And he gets his job back and he goes on to be a chief fire officer for Dublin. <clears throat> but in the meantime, in between all of this activity, throughout 1917, Michael Connolly is very instrumental in the reorganisation of the Irish Women Workers Union. Um, in 1918 and to 1919, he's involved in a situation where the Transport Union decided in the absence of James Larkin that they would try and bring in Bill O'Brien uh, to replace him. People assumed that this was an attempt to actually get rid of Larkin, which is effectively it was. And so Michael Connolly fronts up a campaign to try and call the union out over it. They try and bring it to a head. They all get suspended. 
and they take to the newspapers, they run a campaign and eventually they end up in court and they win their case against the union for, uh, for false dismissal. The union has to reinstate them. Um, and so it, it kind of curbs the plan to try and expel Larkin from the union at that time. He will be expelled in 1924. And again, Michael Connolly, given his standing in the community, given his political activity, um, and given his work as an organiser, he fronts up the case on behalf of Larkin. It gets thrown out of court, but the point is made. And so it's going to be people like Michael Connolly. When, when Larkin decides to found the Workers' Union of Ireland, it's going to be people like Michael Connolly who are highly respected within the community of the North Inner City and the Docklands, who are literally going to leave, lead most of the Dublin uh, members of the ITGWU over into, w, into WUI. And they end up uh, at the end of 1924, the largest union in the country, but they have a really, really tiny membership in Dublin because most of the members have left. And so, when Michael Connolly dies, not surprisingly, there are obituaries in the newspapers, and there's also very, very live reports of his funeral. Um, among the, among the, the, those who attended were Sean T. O'Kelly, who was the vice president at the time. There's a lot of senior politicians, a lot of senior clergymen, and a lot of really well-known people. Um, which shows the type of standing that he had in the community. And that brings us back here to the dislocated doorway once again. As I said earlier, in the 1990s, uh, the port starts to open up and this doorway is no longer fit for purpose. Uh, it's an impediment. The Financial Services Centre has been built. They're going to bring Lewis down through the centre of the port and so it's decided we really need to get rid of this doorway. And so Foss get the job to actually take it apart and reassemble it as, a, as an interesting feature in the port area. And so it moves to the other side of George's Dock near the quayside. Now, uh, and they kind of think, well, if we're going to put it up there, why don't we dedicate it to something? And somebody came up with the idea of, well, sure, why don't we call it an arch? and dedicated to this man, Pat O'Shea. Now, Pat O'Shea had been uh, an assistant uh, director general of FOSS. At the time of the downturn, when containerization came in, when all the jobs in, in the port started to go, when the companies based down the Docklands decided that they were gonna to move to Greensfield sites, uh, out past Tala and Ballyfermot and on the Green, the Green Hills Road, places like that. Um, the area was devastated and Pat O'Shea, although he was a court man, decided he really wanted to do something for the place. And so he, he got personally involved and he, he started to instigate training courses, but then he started to try and find ways around things and do things that were important that needed to be done. And so under his watch, you get things like folklore projects to start up, you get uh, all sorts of heritage projects happen, things like the, the building of the Dyflin, which was a big Viking reproduction ship, happens under Pat O'Shea's watch. And that's probably where the idea that this was originally a triumphal arch comes from, because it was really kind of, it was an affectionate kind of tongue in cheek uh, dedication to a man who actually did quite a lot for the area. And so that pretty much brings us to the end of this talk. Um, other than to say, despite the fact that it's not a triumphal arch, that it doesn't really have anything to do with celebrating the Battle of Waterloo. It's a really beautiful piece of stone masonry. Um, harking back through an awful lot of history of the Docklands area from it's built, from it was built um, in the early 19th century. And it's well worth coming down to have a look at, particularly if you're armed with some of the knowledge of the history of what it's been through and what it's seen. It's a good point to start exploring the Docklands area because there is a lot to see, if you actually know. And then there's plenty of coffee shops um, and cafes um, if you want a bit of refreshment. And it's even next door to the Epic Museum if you fancy doing a little bit of digging into 
your genealogy or the type of things that the Irish got up to when they emigrated from this country. And that brings the latest talk to an end.